you've got some breaking news off the top before we get into the rest of the show. Let's get straight into it. This will come like a bombshell, I imagine, to a lot of Essendon fans. So St Kilda is chasing their captain, Zach Merritt, who's got three years remaining on a contract. It's a bold ploy. It's brash. It's aggressive. That's what the Saints do. Uh, there's no formal contract offer yet, Jimmy, but there is an acknowledgement uh, that's been made from the Saints to the Merritt camp that they would be prepared to offer a godfather deal. I'm talking more than a million dollars a year. He's not on a million dollars a year at the moment and a long-term arrangement. Now, there's no certainty that Merritt would even look at it. There's no certainty that Essendon would even look at it either. In fact, I'd imagine Essendon would have the same response as what Melbourne had with Christian Petrarca. But the obvious retort to this is, well, of course St Kilda's interested in Zach Merritt. They're interested in Marcus Pontebelli and Paddy Cripps and every single other player. What I can tell you is that the discussions between the Merritt camp and St Kilda have become more advanced than they would otherwise be for just any other player. So that's where it is tonight. I can't imagine him leaving, but I thought that before in the past, so it's very much a watch this space. So just putting a bow tie on that, it's more than an inquiry, it's advanced discussions. Uh, it's not advanced discussions, okay. they're more advanced than what they other, yeah, otherwise right. would be. But again, no formal contract offer yet. The Merritt camp is aware of St Kilda's interest in bringing him in, so that's absolutely one to watch. We'll talk about Dustin Martin with you a little bit later on, Lee. But let's get to the games of the weekend, and they were two absolute belters. Uh, the first one in Adelaide on Friday night where Port overcame Hawthorne by three points. Interestingly, Port v Hawthorne, they played, to, they played against each other in three finals. Every single result has been by three points in 01, 2014, and then on the weekend. And then the Brisbane Lions, Lee, your Brisbane Lions uh, got the job done against the Giants. And that where is, that's where it's at at the moment, Lee. Uh, what do you make of uh, what you see in terms of the prelims to come and what we saw on the weekend? Well, I think going into the, uh, the finals, we always thought uh, Carlton sort of limped in a bit, but the top seven all looked like they were pretty good teams. So the fact is we got to a final four and one of the, the lines obviously finished outside the top four, but are, are there for preliminary finals. So very even. I think every team has got a really good chance because there was not much between the bunch of those teams when we uh, finished the home and away series. And Geelong and Sydney, Brisbane and Port, uh, do you think they're the best four teams in it? I mean, we'll talk about the Giants' missed opportunity in a bit, but very hard to argue against at least the two home teams there, Jimmy. Well, the top four, uh, well, the, top four the preliminary finals, are the best four in it because they're the ones who have been able to sustain uh, their seasons, get themselves in a good position. Brisbane, uh, coming from outside the top four, we always thought at the start of the year they were a top four quality side. They're mature, they're experienced. They've been at this point end, I think, now four out of the last five years. Let's talk about last night's game. It was the first semi-final since 2002 where both teams scored 100 points. It was rollicking. At one stage, the margin was 44 points, down to 13, back up to 31 points, and in the end, it was a five-point win to the Brisbane Lions. Where does that rank for you, Jimmy, in terms of pure entertainment for finals that you've seen? Oh, you touch on that. It was fast. It was up and back. Uh, Brisbane had a lot of shots on goal. Being at, at the ground uh, last night, it didn't feel like a 40-point lead because Brisbane was still getting plenty of opportunities forward of the ball and then they just weren't converting. That was a bit of the, the question mark always around Brisbane. Can they convert? But didn't they do that in the second yeah. half? They made the most of every opportunity and momentum. Now, Lee's touched on it. If you could actually work out how you can capture momentum, <laughs> you'd be a very, very rich man. And momentum last night was wild, as you said. Jimmy, 666 helps out the stand rule. Uh, that paints a picture as well. The second biggest comeback in finals history, Lee. Well, very unusual, really. I mean, 44 points is a big margin, but that was just before three-quarter time, you know, 10 minutes before three-quarter time. So that's a big margin to be wound back in a quarter and a bit. Um, so, yeah, the Lions were great. And, of course, the other team, other side of the coin is the Giants just faded really badly. The, the celebrations were wild for the Lions, weren't they, Jimmy? It was great to watch after the game. We're going to talk about the Lions to start. Uh, I, I just loved watching Dane Zorko in the last quarter, the All-Australian. Hugh McCluggage was massive as well. Um, I know that you're a Giants man. You're not a director at the moment. But that must warm the heart. Yeah, and, look, I think it, it, we touched on the scores there, but it was actually a great coaching battle. I think in the first half, uh, what Adam Kingsley was doing around stoppages, uh, how he was trying to get his run with roles with Peatling and, uh, of course, Bedford on there, uh, Zorko and Neil, and then they'll bring in the extra up. And then I think what the Lions did, their ability to adjust, and then also some big players stepped up in big moments. Yeah, and some of those players were veterans. Joe Danaher was one of them, Lee. Uh, you spoke about him a couple of weeks ago. Before you have your thoughts on last night, this was Lee Matthews a fortnight ago, pumping up Joe Danaher's tyres, when perhaps um, some other commentators in the media were going the other way. So that's what you'd be saying to Joe Danaher. Joe, we'll wear your odd mistake. 
you you make a bad decision every now and again because he's an instinctive player. And But if he gets scared of making mistakes, and I heard people critiquing the coach, they say he hasn't been coached hard enough. Well, if you keep talking about what he's not good at, he'll lose confidence in himself. So last night, Lee, we saw the worst of him early and the very best of him late, and they wouldn't have won without him. He made his few mistakes, no doubt about that. But uh, what he does to him is he, he plays well in finals, and he's got a, his conversion accuracy is much better in finals than it is in home and away series. So the, uh, the pressure doesn't seem to phase him. So we see a few of these, gave away a free kick, a couple of times where really you think, Joe, do you, should you really run past for a hand pass in that situation? Kicked it out of bounds on the full. But when you get to uh, a couple of clutch kicks, uh, late in the game, I mean, this is on the boundary line, just straight as a die, that puts the Lions, I think, a point behind. And then he takes this really good, strong, contested mark against Sam Taylor and goes back and again splits the middle. So those two kicks were beautiful off the boot. Um, so, uh, you yeah, know, Joe had, the, uh, had the, the clutch goals, four goals won on the night, but the clutch goals so, so valuable. And that, that big contest that got that final one, which was the match winner, that was the only second time this year Sam Taylor's been beaten in a one-on-one -on -one contest. And what a, what a time for the Brisbane Lions. And I like to call it, Lee, you've heard me say this on radio when we work together. With Joe Danaher, it's the full Joe Danaher experience. <laughs> Just strap yourself in because the good will be something really special like we saw towards the end of the game. But the not so good can be quite entertaining for the impartial fan. And that's why you pay the big four. Sorry, Lee, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was saying, the, the thing is about him, though, the pressure of finals doesn't seem to phase him. Now, he made a couple of mistakes early in the game here last, last night, but as I said about his goal-scoring accuracy, he does it better in finals than he does in home and away games. So all that means is when the pressure is at its highest, you know, he was good in the grand final last year. He plays well in finals. That's a, a really good sign. And maybe it's because he doesn't really take much notice of the footy world. He lives two hours away from the club. Um, he doesn't have a TV in his house, I read today. So he doesn't take any notice of the external noise. And when uh, push comes to shove, he plays some amazing footy. Chris Fagan, I love this last night, post-game. Let's have a listen to the Brisbane Lions coach. I was happy for Harris to keep doing what he was doing. Um, and to be honest with you, I'm a coach who trusts my players. I've, I've done that since the day I arrived, and I think that can take you far. Um, and the times to trust them sometimes when they're not going all that well, um, that's probably the time to do it. So, you know, hopefully Jack's learned a good lesson tonight and he'll be a better player for the experience that he had tonight next week. Well, Jesse Hogan was outstanding and Jack Payne happened to be his opponent, but he certainly was terrific, uh, Hogan. And you thought, well, would they put Harris Andrews on him? But could Harris Andrews have actually defended him any better than Jack Payne did? That's the question. And I really love the fact that, uh, as Chris uh, Fagan said outright, he prioritises perseverance over constant change. And therefore, he backs his players in. Every now and again, that's going to blow up in your face. But I think I agree with him. I think gives them confidence. Most of it will work for you. It was a breathtaking last 40 minutes for the Lions, kicking 11 goals three, four goals 12 before that. The old Lions, then into the new Lions. And you need some heroes. And we just put down the bottom... There's some heroes for the Lions. And the one that jumps out at me is Ashcroft. Some of his moments, there was a passage of play where the, the ball was dribbling in dispute and he just relentless kept going after it, kept going after it, breaking tackles. I think I counted six giants. He either fought off from a tackle or beat in the one-on-one -on -one contest. Berry was rock solid. Dunkley always kept showing up. But the Zorko one was fascinating. I think his battle with Peatling, I think Peatling had him under wraps, kicking goals. But he pushed himself up in the ground and had his big moments. Two goals, nine touches, and Lee touched on Joe Danaher. And you could even throw in Kel Archie when the game was really hot and the Lions were under the pump. He was a match-up nightmare for the Giants. Yeah, and th that top name there, Will Ashcroft, 11 weeks, I think it's 11 weeks, yeah. after returning from an ACL, he's had a remarkable couple of months and his performance last night was, ama was amazing. Now, uh, some news on Lockie Neal. He returned to Brisbane today. He was in a moon boot. The nine news cameras uh, took him here. But the Lockie Neal is such an important player for them, but he's been struggling for a while, Jimmy, with his foot injury. Uh, Chris Fagan said after the game that he's uh, not training early in the week too much. You'd expect him to be OK, but it is somewhat of a concern. Yeah, I think the moon boot scares a lot of people, but uh, clubs are, are probably more readily grabbing out the moon boot as soon as there's a foot, ankle, lower leg injury. Take all the pressure and weight off. If they're managing him through the week, they've got to manage him for their sake. 
two more weeks. All right, we go from the very good to the very bad. The heat this week and all summer will be on the GWS Giants, Adam Kingsley, the leadership group and their players. This one would really sting. Straight sets. Lee, Jimmy, I want to get your thoughts. But before we do, this was their coach, Adam Kingsley, post-game. It would appear we haven't yet learnt that lesson to... Um to still be proactive, to execute the system as best as we can, to, to remain aggressive, um, to be aware of the opposition when they do roll the dice a little bit and roll forward, as you do in those moments, um, to be to be safe and strong in contest and, and win the ball. We, we're just not uh, we're not the finished product yet, and I've been saying that all year. Well, clearly they're not the finished product, Lee, but pre-season, Adam Kingsley and the Giants were telling everyone that they were all going to be about speed and also endurance and running. Over the summer, they did more running than they've ever done before. And at the most critical moment of the season, when they needed to run and they needed to play with flair and see two games out, they failed, and that would really hurt them. Well, I looked like a pretty good product when they were 44 fr uh, points in front uh, late in the third quarter. But they've had two games where they've faded badly. And, and I think there can be a phys physical and mental part of that. But I thought early in the last quarter last night, when they were four goals in front still, they sort of wanted to kick... They kicked the ball across their half-back line a couple of times. And I, it's kind of like, OK, we're now in lead protection mode, when really the teams that come from behind usually are able to overtake the leader because they stop scoring. And that's exactly what happened last night. And, of course, last week against the Swans, where they've stopped scoring. And I just wonder whether they went into the league protection mode, started to play slowly, got the, and this, the run disappeared from their game. Yeah, Lee, I think it's more mental. And reputations can be built. We, we learnt the reputation of Collingwood when they won the grand final. You can come back from nowhere. So the opposition starts to think, well, Collingwood are never at it. The Giants next year have got to actually build a reputation back that they won't crack because the Swans cracked them yep. in the last quarter and the Lions cracked them in the last 40 minutes. So we just uh, highlight uh, throughout the year that, you know, where the Giants are falling down. So what I think, Lee and Tom, is finals expose your warts. So whatever you've been doing really bad or poorly during the year, it just gets amplified against the best sides and under pressure. And these are the numbers we've been highlighting all year. And you had to look at those numbers beforehand, how the Swans and the Lions got a hold of the Giants. It's this transition game, up and back, up and back, decision-making, key moments, which we touched on the Swans. And we grabbed a few out here. McCluggage is the one to watch. He is in the back pocket. He's kicked that with his left foot. And you watch the amount of Lions repeat efforts. Keep an eye on Rayner too, number 16, coming through the middle of the ground. Repeat efforts. And this is from back 50 to forward 50. Only North Melbourne and Richmond conceded more inside 50s than the Giants. So 17th and 18th. So when you get to the big moment, it's a hard time to correct all those poor stats from 23, 24 weeks. The opposition just exposes them. So we, we had another one there. This is still playing out, so we haven't had time to come away. But Cluggage again, <laughs> yeah. he's already at the other end. Kicking, he just missed a brilliant goal, but this whole transition, that's poor manning up there from Whitfield. Berry off the back. Again, half back. And look at the look to the big key moment here where Joe Danaher wins that one-on-one -on -one against Sam Taylor. Look at the space yeah. for big Joe. He only has to just shrug off Taylor, and he's got too much height, and that led to the match winner. Lee, as a coach, how do you deal with this over the next six months? Oh, well, as I say, I think they've played enough good footy. Yes, they've faded badly in a couple of games that really count uh, the last couple of weeks, but they, they restricted the Lions to only nine inside 50 marks. So they had 50, 30 shots at goal, 15-15, 30 shots at goal, the Lions, but only nine of them for marks. I think one of their vulnerabilities is the ground-level defence. Like, the, it was the Lions' ground-level players that kicked them the score. I mean, Joe Danner took that, la that last contested mark, obviously, and kicked the goal. But mostly it was the ground-level Lions players that actually just made, made the Geelong... Uh, sorry, the, uh, the Giants' ground-level defence just look a bit shaky. Far for me to analyse the game like you, Jimmy, or you, Lee, but there's just this moment in the last quarter to me was absolutely crucial. If Brett Daniels hadn't taken the advantage, then it would have been a 25-point lead to the Giants at that point, uh, but he didn't. But instead he took it and he kicked it off the ground and he missed the goal. And that was an important moment in the game because that was the 50-metre penalty we're looking at there. This is the moment I'm talking about. You know, right there, Brent Daniels should just stop. But instead, he has a crack, misses the goal, and the game swung on those small moments, Jimmy. Yeah, well, and this is what I've been reiterating throughout the year. It's moments, it's decision-making, it's footy IQ, it's keeping you calm in the heat. As Lee touched on with Joe Danner, he seems to be pretty calm in the big moments, and that's what finals are about. Yep. Uh, the window, Jimmy. The Giants have played 
finals in seven of their last eight years. They're widely seen as one of the most credentialed lists in the AFL. Yet they haven't won a flag yet. And they had such an amazing draft bounty. Toby Green, Jeremy Cameron, who's now gone. Nick Haynes is probably going to go as well. We'll talk about him later on. Um, it just... It, to me, like, the window doesn't last forever. Do you think that they've still got a long time left to win one, or is it shutting? No, I don't think it, it's shutting. They've still got a lot of talent on that list. They've got some draftees coming through. And like all clubs who try to stay up, you've got to have development, recruiting, everything in your football department, all aligned and a well-oiled machine. I think they've got something pretty good up there. Yeah, I do as well. Mm. But they'd be wanting to play a prelim or a grand final Correct. next year. Straight sets is no good for them. I think in the last quarter, across the last two games of this season, they were down 57 points. Right. You're watching Footy Furnace, and the news tonight is that Ken Hinckley and Port Adelaide, more specifically, have, fi have been fined $20,000 under the AFL's Rule 2.3a, Conduct Unbecoming. Now, the sanction was determined after an AFL investigation from that incident on Friday night. And in a statement released by the AFL. Stephen Mead, the General Counsel, said, as we reiterate, reiterated last week, opposition officials and players inappropriately engaging each other is something we don't want to see because of the potential to escalate and the example that it sets to football at lower levels. And we're disappointed uh, that the moment got taken away from what was one of the great finals matches. $20,000, Jimmy, is the same number as what Jason McCartney got last week for making physical contact with Tom Papley. Your thoughts say that on the $20,000, it what? seems to become a, a benchmark number that they grab. It's com I think it's completely right. ridiculous. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in Lee's thoughts, but that is not a $20,000 sanction. If you listen to actually what Ken Hinckley said, surely the right outcome here is Andrew Dillon or Laura Kane calls Ken Hinckley and says, please don't do that again, and he apologises and everyone moves on. I think this is way too heavy-handed and completely uh, ridiculous, in some ways embarrassing for the AFL. It's interesting, Tom. I, I agree with that, that it sounds a lot, but I'm also OK with the zero-tolerance aspect of it, and we've got to remind ourselves... The Giants pay the $20,000 and Port Adelaide mm. pay the $20,000. So the individuals aren't being fined. So we're very dear. It's like just money going around the circle within, within the, AFL, like the AFL system. But I would have thought that almost everybody who's been involved in it would probably regret it. I think Ginnivan would regret the fact that he tweeted it. Ken would regret the fact that he actually did that after the game. Uh, James Sisley, well, he didn't do much wrong, but maybe he'd even regret that he was a, you know, a little bit aggressive there. And even Sam Mitchell in his, uh, in his post-match press conference was pretty, pretty, pretty harsh. And I think most of them would think, in the, in the clear light of day, maybe we all overreacted. Yeah, I, I just think we sanitise the game so much, Jimmy. Like, I've got no, in, no issue with what Ginevan did on social media. I, what Hinkley did, I don't think it's the end of the world either. I just think we don't want to take the personalities out of the game. And I think slowly but surely we are. It's important to set the right example, but it didn't escalate. He didn't swear at the Hawks. He didn't say anything overtly abusive or aggressive in a way that offended anyone. I think it's a gross overreaction. It was great theatre or great yeah. telly, as they say. You couldn't get your eyes off the TV screen. But everyone seemed to forget about the two hours beforehand. <laughs> and we had a cracking game, a new highlight, another three-point result in a final between Port Adelaide and Hawthorne. So how did Port Adelaide turn it around in seven to eight days? Well, they got them back in a day early. They reviewed it pretty hard. And they... You know, stripped it right back. And for me, Tom, it came back to the fundamentals and core and pressure. And the pressure rating, and as we called it, it's the hot dog of stats. I'm not sure what quite goes into it, but it sounds pretty cool, <laughs> Lee. But this is what stood out to me, especially in the first quarter, and what pressure does. This is forcing the quick kick long down the line. Now, this gives your defenders an opportunity to defend. This was completely lacking against the Cats. We saw the Cats run and chain the footy away. But look at all these. Defenders are able to peel off, but I love this from Jones. I thought he played a really good game, not a huge stats game. But you get the intercept, and look at this, how brave you are. First quarter, four minutes to go, whack. Have that horn, Francis, that it completely undoes your zone. Again, pressure, Darcy Byrne-Jones, mightn't seem like much. And look at that, a leer up the back of his direct opponent, which means you can spoil and have impact. The pressure here again, Rioli, forwards. Just for something, good things come off the back of that, and that's finals footy, and probably the biggest moment, the place erupted with this tackle from DBJ. Yeah. It was enormous. Like, it absolutely exploded. So from start to finish, the pressure, it gives you opportunities, but it forces those long kicks down the line. We look at some of the stats uh, on there and the uncontested marks. Because you've got that pressure and then you cut out the releases... You force the long down the line, and that's all defenders are asking for, an opportunity with a long, slow ball in. That's great analysis, Jimmy. Ken Hinckley must feel vindicated here, Lee, after a tough week. Well, I don't know about vindicated. What he did is he got his players up. I mean, they were horrible against Geelong, 84 points. They were terrible. 
But it, we take too much notice of what happened last weekend in the general sense. So it's a seven days later and his team came up. Full credit to Ken Hinckley that he got them to that optimum level of uh, emotional sort of aggression. Uh, that they, they got ten holding the balls. And I think they got five holding the balls against Hawthorne in the first quarter. That was critical because Hawthorne, Hawthorne had been waltzing through the opposition tackles. But the, uh, the Port Adelaide tackling pressure early... By, by late in the first quarter, the Hawthorne was second-guessing themselves and Port uh, were on top. Lee, well, yeah, and talking of aggression, everyone loves it when the big banana in the middle <laughs> starts it off. Jordan Sweet, he, he led the aggression for Port Adelaide. Well, particularly when Lloyd Meek has been doing that for, uh, for Hawthorne. He's a big, strong ruckman, Lord, Lloyd Meek. But I thought uh, Sweet was good. I'm on, I thought he probably won the battle. But more than that, he just looked as strong as Meek. There wasn't any look that all of a sudden the uh, Meek was going to sort of outstrength uh, the, his Port Adelaide apart, uh, opponent. As we know, there's about 80 stoppages a game where the umpire puts the ball back into play. So the two big guys, their, their attitude and their aggression at the contest reflects what's going on within the team, and Port got that from Sweet.